title of this morning's message is Jesus, the one true cornerstone. I've been a believer for almost 36 years, and what God has been impressing upon my heart is that it is not enough just to start quickly, but we have to finish well. It's not enough just to start quickly, but we have to finish well. I remember when I was 18 years old and I first came to faith in Jesus Christ, And I was coming out of futility, coming out of darkness, coming out and trying to understand God in my own human understanding and reasoning. And then came to a point in my life where I just surrendered and I said, yes, Lord Jesus Christ, your way is the right way. My way is the wrong way. And the Lord came into my life. And I remember my first Christmas as a believer in Jesus. It was the most beautiful Christmas I ever had because I really knew what Christmas was about. It wasn't about getting a lot of gifts. It wasn't about just uh, celebrating outside of, of the Christmas tree going down to Rockefeller Center. It wasn't about that thing. Was, I, I received the gift of life that he who knew no sin became sin for me. I received the gift of life that him who was without sin suffered and died and bled on the cross for me. And I began to learn that I belong to a different kingdom. That I was underneath a different authority and I was rooted and grounded inside of the work of Jesus Christ. I thought, you know something, I'm a believer now. Things are going to be easy. <laughs> Life is going to go good and I know who Jesus is. But as soon as you accept the Lord, the attack of the enemy comes in. He tries to steal, kill, and destroy. He tries to take away the revelation that God has given you. He tries to move right in. And the Lord began to show me through all these years, the race is not given to the swift or to the strong, but to those who endure. We have to have endurance. We have to run the race with the end in sight, knowing that we are here just for a momentary period of time, but that what we do now carries over into eternity. That what we do now, it carries over into eternity. And that as I grow older, I pray that God gives me more wisdom, more knowledge, more revelation, more of his anointing in my life that I can continue to run the race. The degree of me running this race successfully is dependent upon what foundation my life is built upon. If you have a foundation that's shaky, that's built upon just head knowledge, but not personal revelation of Jesus Christ, you will not be able to stand when trials come, when difficulty comes, when the storm comes. And this whole message is about Jesus Christ, him being that solid rock, him being that the one whom we can stand upon and not be shaken, him being the one we can place all our trust and hope in and never be disappointed because he always comes through. It's about him being that very solid ground that even though the whole world may be crumbling around you, everything falling to the left, falling to the right, but you remain solid and steadfast because you're standing on Jesus Christ. I've never known him to fail not one time to accomplish his purpose. He's never failed. He's never been defeated. He's never been overcome by the enemy. He's always been victorious. And the key to a victorious life is living underneath the authority of a, of a victorious God. Always, always comes to pass. And his word never fails. We have been studying a message on the uniqueness of Jesus Christ. And this message fits in with that, that, that whole teaching. Because there is no one like Jesus. Not Buddha, not Muhammad, not secular humanism, not the wisdom of man. There's nobody like Jesus Christ. And as Pastor was preaching last week, the Lord began to give me a revelation that Jesus is the second Adam because the first Adam was born, was created by God without sin. Before his falling in the Garden of Eden, there was no sin. He was sinless. Jesus Christ, born in Bethlehem, in a manger without sin, 
without spot, without blemish. And the Lord began to show me also that he's the only person in history in which we begin the demarcation of time. We go to B.C. before Christ and Anno Domini, the year of our Lord after Christ. It's not after Buddha. <laughs> not after Confucius. It's after Christ. But it's so ironic when I was Looking at this, my, my son, who's taking uh, anthropology class, he came home, and I saw one of his books. It no longer says B.C. and A.D. It's before common era. In common era. I'm saying, when did this happen? And they began to tell me, you know something? We changed it not because of any religious, uh, uh, lack of regard for any religious affiliation, but we changed it because we want to more accurately be able to, to denote time, how time is, is, is denoted. And I looked it up in an article, why some of the reasons why they changed it to BCE and the CE instead of BC and AD. The first thing it says, several good reasons to change time to BCE. First off, AD is almost certainly inaccurate that if Jesus existed, he wasn't born in the year suggested. Second thing. B.C. and A.D. privileged the role of Christianity in a society where it is no longer the defining belief system. Number three, B.C. and A.D. imply the validity of truth of Christian theology, specifically that Jesus is Lord. Four, B.C. and A.D. forced non-Christians to imply or to acknowledge the supremacy of Christianity. They changed it because they want to strip Jesus of his uniqueness and they want to strip Jesus of his deity. Here to say this morning that we cannot strip God of his lordship. <laughs> no matter what if we say BCE, CE, common era, before common era, he's the same today, yesterday, and forever. He never changes. You cannot strip him of who he is. Even if you don't believe that he's the son of God, he still is the son of God. Even if you don't believe he's coming again to judge the living and the dead, he is still upon the throne. He's still coming with authority. He's still coming with power. He's still able to move the waters by the releasing of his spirit. He's still able to overcome everything that you face today. Jesus Christ is the same today, yesterday, and forever. The one chief cornerstone. The stone upon which everything else can be laid upon. It will be fit tightly and it will not move. It will not shake because it's built upon that solid rock foundation of who he is. The world feels this way. But I'm often shocked that the church of Jesus Christ feels this way too. I was listening to a sermon. And one theology student was talking about how he went to a large church. And the pastor was preaching, you know something? You know, Jesus ain't though it's not the only way to heaven. All religions are basically the same. Just try to be a good person. And that, you know, you'll, you'll go to heaven. And the theology student was really baffled. I'm saying this guy has a PhD in theology. He's associated with a very well-known church. And how could he preach these kind of things? And at the end of the service... The theology student began to walk out of the church, and he met the pastor at the end of the door. The pastor shook his hand and said, you know, how would you like my sermon? You know, how would you like the message I was preaching? And the theology student shook his hand and said, you know something? What you're preaching is allowing people to go to hell. And he walked out. The uniqueness of Jesus Christ, the one true foundation upon everything that's built upon let us open our books to the Bible, to the book of Acts, chapter 3. We're going to see that Jesus Christ is that true, that foundation upon which everything else can be built upon. Acts, chapter 3. We're going to begin reading with verse 1. Acts 3, begin reading with verse 1. It says, and now Peter and John went up together to the temple. 
at the hour of prayer, the ninth hour. And a certain man came from his mother's womb, a certain man lame from his mother's womb was carried, whom they laid daily at the gate of the temple, which is called Beautiful, to ask alms from those who entered the temple. Who, seeing Peter and John about to go into the temple, asked for alms, and fixing his eyes upon him with John, Peter said, look at us. First thing we're seeing, a man who is crippled from birth, a man who's because of his infirmity, most likely is unable to earn a living. And he's seeking substance, financial substance, but God is going to give him a spiritual healing that's going to take care of all his problems, all his financial problems, all his worries. And in verse 4, it says, and fixing his eyes upon him with John and Peter said, look at us. So he gave them his attention, expecting to receive something from them. Then Peter said, silver and gold I do not have, but what I do have I give you in the name of Jesus of Nazareth to rise up and walk. And he took him by the right hand and lifted him up, and immediately his feet and ankle bones received strength. So he, leaping up, stood and walked and entered the temple with them, walking, leaping, and praising God. First thing I know about this is even in the medical field, I know this is an impossibility in the natural. There is physical atrophy of the joints, of the muscles. The legs are not going to be able to withstand the weight of the person. But God's word is so powerful that he's releasing the name of Jesus Christ over that sickness. Releasing it in the name of Jesus. He's releasing the name of Jesus Christ right over the infirmity. And God becomes the God of Shabbat. He begins to build New ligaments, new strength in his ankle bones, strength in his body that this man is not able to walk, not able to walk before, but now he's able to leap. He wasn't even able to walk. Now he's able to leap. He's able to jump for joy because God has done a miraculous thing in his life. He's not even able to walk in the beginning. But now he's leaping for joy because the, the, the Spirit of God has touched him. And in verse 9, and all the people saw him walking and praising God. Then they knew that it was he who sat begging for alms at the beautiful gate of the temple. And they were filled with wonder and amazement at what had happened to him. And now when the lame man who was healed held on to Peter and John, all the people ran together to them in the porch, which is called Simon's, greatly amazed. So when Peter saw it, he responded to the people, men of Israel, why do you marvel at this? Or why do you look so intently at us? Though by our own power or godliness, we have made this man walk. The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. The God of our fathers has glorified his servant Jesus, whom you delivered up and denied in the presence of Pilate, where he was determined to let him go. But you denied the Holy One and the just and asked for a murderer to be granted to you and kill the Prince of Life whom God raised from the dead of which we are witness. And his name and in his name and through faith in his name he has made this man strong whom you see. Yes, the faith which comes through him has given this, has given him perfect soundness in the presence of all. Perfect soundness. Perfect wholeness. Perfect wellness. The desire of God for you is that you live in perfect soundness. Perfect wholeness. That you not lack any good thing. That you live in perfect peace. The desire of God for you this morning is to live in perfect soundness, perfect wholeness. He's a God who makes broken things whole. He is a God who knows what to do because he created us in the first place. He is a God of perfect soundness, wholeness, wellness, and healing. So this man is made well. The people are rejoicing 
But as we'll see, the religious leaders of this time, they're getting angry. They're getting upset. Telling you this morning that if you determine to serve Jesus Christ, you're going to stir up things. You're going to stir up things in your job, in your household, in your home, in your workplace. Because there's something about the light of Jesus Christ that causes darkness to flee. There's going to be so much light in you that people who are used to being into darkness are not going to be around, don't want to be around you. Because they sense you have a, you are of another spirit. You're carrying a, another one. Another spirit is in you. The spirit of the one who rose Jesus Christ from the dead is living inside of you. And you begin to stir up things. And you're going to have received persecution because there's light that's coming forth. An enemy always wants to cover up the light. Because as a believer in Jesus Christ, begin to know things won't get better as you begin to stir them. More attacks come because you're standing for the king. You have to be able, steadfast, strong, to be rooted and grounded inside of the principles of God's word. You may stand every day for the gospel of Jesus Christ. Because when you say you're a Christian, you're a believer, people start to watch you. They listen to what you say. They act, they look, they look, they see, try to see the way you act, the way you treat people. Because they're trying to find inconsistency between the proclamation of your mouth and the way you live your life. Each and every day, we're on the battlefields and the battle lines and the front line. We are men who are like marked men and women because we have the steel of the Holy Spirit on us. But don't worry. He overcame the devil, he overcame our flesh. He overcame the grave. <laughs> so the religious leaders are going to really, really going to come after them. And in Acts chapter 4, if we're going to fast forward to that, we're going to see how the priests of the temple, they're going to really want to try to destroy this testimony of this man being made whole in the name of Jesus Christ. In Acts chapter 4, beginning with verse 1, it says, Now... They spoke to the people, the priests, and the captain of the temple. And the Sadducees came upon them, and being greatly disturbed, that they taught the people and preached Jesus and the resurrection from the dead. And they laid hands on them and put them in custody until the next day, for it was already evening. However, many of those who heard the word believed, and the number of men who came, the number of men who came to be about 5,000. 5,000 people saved at one time. 5,000 people. It's hard in most Christian churches of America to get one person saved. What was so different about the Spirit of God in those days? It's the same Holy Spirit, the same God. But as a church in America, we have to take God's word literally, that it is truth, that it is light, that it does transform lives. They believed. Came to pass. 5,000 men came to faith. And in verse 5, it's, verse 6, it says, as well as Ananias, the high priest, and, Cana, and Caiaphas, and John, and Alexander, many as were of the family of the high priest, were gathered together at Jerusalem. And when they had set them in the midst, they asked, by what power and by what name have you done this? Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said, rulers of the people and elders of Israel, if we this day are judged for good deeds done to a helpless man, by what means he has been made well? Let it be known to you and all, and known to you and unto all the people of Israel, that the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, 
whom God raised from the dead, by, his, by this, this man stands here before you whole. That Jesus is the stone which the master builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. That salvation is found in no one else, for there's no other name under heaven given unto men by which we must be saved. The chief cornerstone, the chief foundation is Jesus Christ. The Lord showed me about foundation. First principle, he showed me that as, as we build our life upon Jesus Christ, that he's the solid rock, that he's our foundation, and it allows what is built upon him to stand the test of time. What is built upon him will stand the test of time. Because we're building upon a ground that is solid, that is steady, that is stable. Often, when I was a young man, I said before, I, I thought I was a believer in Jesus Christ. I started out Friday night. I said the sinner's prayer. I thought I'm saved. By Monday morning, I'm doing the same thing. Because I was building my faith upon my own head knowledge, not revelation from heaven. The devil began to convince me, you know something? Why try to believe in Jesus Christ? Just give up. You are meant to go to hell. Hell was your destiny. Hell was your calling. You keep trying to get away from what you're predestined to do. You're not meant to be saved. You're not meant to have eternal life. Your destiny is to live and to die and to go into hell. I was depressed. I was feeling broken because I felt that I it was hopeless. I, I wasn't able to, to accomplish the miracle of salvation in my own human strength. But then one day, look at out my side, my bedroom window, and the projects of the Lower East Side Manhattan. <laughs> I said, yes, Lord Jesus Christ, you are right. Your way is the right way. My way is the wrong way. My life changed. I was filled with the Holy Spirit. Later, I began to speak in tongues. I was anointed with the Spirit of God because it wasn't what I could do. It was about me getting revelation of the true cornerstone. It wasn't what people could say to me. It was, it was the word of God becoming flesh. It was Jesus becoming tangible and real. I grew up in the Catholic church. and I, I used to have dreams and visions with demonic and spiritual attacks upon me. And I got myself a figurine, a, a picture, a, a statue with the sacred heart of Jesus Christ upon this statue. And this statue had a heart of Christ in it. And he was standing on the world. And I figured if I put that statue by my bed, I won't have any nightmares. Nightmares continued. The spiritual attack continued. I accepted Jesus Christ. And I remember we used to play basketball, football. Some teams would go have overnight trips. And I'm saying, hey, we, I'm going to stay in a hotel room with a bunch of guys. And I'm going to wake up screaming in the middle of the night. They're going to think I'm gone. You know, I, I don't know what's going to happen. But I went, and I was the sweetest sleep in my life. It was just a, such a presence of God over me. And I slept almost as being in his arms. And there was such peace because Jesus went from being a theo theological concept to the reality of who he is. And he came from living on the outside to taking residence in my heart. And that's why I'm determined no matter where I go, no matter what I do, I'm going to tell people about Jesus. I'm going to declare the glory of God. As long as there's breath in my lungs, I will declare that he is Lord. As long as there's strength in my body, I will declare that he is the only king. As long as I walk upon this earth, I will declare that Jesus Christ is the one true cornerstone. That he is the one that we build upon. And he is the rock that cannot be broken, shaken, or twisted out of proportion. Building upon the foundation of Jesus Christ allows what is building to stand, that we may stand the test of time. Second thing the Lord showed me, that if we build upon the foundation of Jesus Christ, it allows for even more layers of revelation to be laid upon us because 
as we accept him, accept his word, we begin to receive revelation from heaven. We begin to receive knowledge, and that knowledge is built up and rooted up in us. Because if we don't have that strong foundation, how can we add things to it? Many churches, we try to, we're going to go after the spiritual things. We're going to go after aspects of things. We're going to talk about different doctrines. I heard people even talk about, I want to understand the doctrine of the Nephilim, all these kind of different things they want to understand, these, these things that are, that are so, so, actually I'm called esoteric, but, but you need the meat of the word. You need the meat of the word of God. You need basic foundational truth. And when you get the basic foundational truth, you can put layers of revelation on it because it will be able to stick into you because you got that solid foundation. It's founded now. It's rooted and grounded in you now. And now God can pour more revelation, more wisdom out on you because you have that foundation that is solid set. Third thing the Lord showed me is when we build upon Jesus Christ being the solid rock, being the cornerstone, we build according to the plumb line. We build according to the plumb line that is Christ Jesus. What is built is straight, is in alignment with God. And most importantly, as a believer, it's always important to be in alignment with God in prayer that your prayers will be heard. Be into alignment with the word of God that power may fall forth. Because if we're not in alignment with God, we're working outside of his will, outside of his authority, outside of his, his, his presence and his power to move us. Because if we build upon the solid foundation of Jesus Christ, we are built upon the plumb line. We are in direct, we're in lockstep, we're in one accord with the Lord. The last thing the Lord showed me is that being built upon this solid foundation will allow God to establish good, sound, biblical character, godly character in my life. And as you read the Bible, you begin to notice that the people that God chose to, to do the work of the ministry warn most of the most gifted people in the natural. He chose Gideon, who was threshing grain in a wine press, hiding from the Midianites, and he said he called him a mighty man of God, a man of valor. Samuel went to the house of Jesse, and he came in, and he said, the next king of Israel is coming out. Oh, I got that king. There's his son right now. He's tall. He's handsome. He's strong. He looks good. That's the man God has chosen. The Lord told him, you look at the external, but God looks at the heart. And God said, you know something? I haven't chosen this one, but I'm choosing a little, a ruddy-faced shepherd boy because he's going to have my heart. He's going he's gonna to be grieved with the things that I'm grieved for. He's going to carry my heart. He's not going to be concerned about what he can do in his own natural strength and ability. By being rooted and grounded upon that foundation of Christ Jesus, it allows godly character begins to flow forth from me. And I begin to be a man that can be trusted with the, with the oracles of God. God is not looking for the Tudebo Shaba. He's not looking for the most gifted man. He's looking for people whose hearts are in lockstep with his heart. That he can trust you with the oracles of God. And he can trust you with the vision of God. And he can trust you with God's planning. And he can trust you. He can trust. Because we have a foundation that won't move, that won't shake, that the world can't understand, that even the, the storms and the wind and the rain comes, but we stand. Difficulties come, financial difficulties come, sickness tries to knock at the door, but we stand. Weakness in our flesh comes, but we stand because in our weakness, his strength is made known. Trials on the job come. They try to knock you off of your 
positional, off, off of your position of faith and trust in Jesus Christ. But we stand. Life and everything the enemy tries to throw at you, like the kitchen sink comes at you, but because you are standing on the solid rock of Jesus Christ, you stand. It may come, it may be like the day of Job when his friends told him, you have lost everything you value, everything you possess, everything that you hold dear to you. Why don't you just curse God and die? But Job says, no, blessed be the name of the Lord. The Lord giveth and the Lord taketh away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Solid foundation, Jesus Christ, that we stand upon him, rooted and grounded in him. I'd like to turn to the last set of scriptures in the book of Colossians chapter 2. And this is very familiar because we studied this. Colossians chapter 2, verses 6 through 8, I'm going to read. Colossians 2, verses uh, 6 through 8 says, As you therefore have received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him, being rooted and built up in him, and established in the faith, as you have been taught, abounding in it with thanksgiving. Beware, lest anyone through philosophy and empty deceit, according to the tradition of men, according to the basic principles of this world, not according to Christ. For him, for in him dwells all the fullness of the Godhead. That is simply that God desires to be rooted, us to be grounded, us to be like Jesus Christ, rooted and grounded in Jesus that we may become strong, that we'll be like the oak tree, that when the wind comes and the storm comes and the storm comes, we'll still stand because we're standing upon the faithfulness of who he is. Last thing I'd like to talk to you about is about Thursday. I know Mama V knows uh, Thursday was like a horrific snowstorm. I left work at 3.30, and almost 8 o'clock, I was still trying to get to the George Washington Bridge. On the upper level, there was a 30-car pileup. The bridge was closed down twice, two hours and two-hour two increments consecutively. As you look at the television, people are getting so mad. I'm mad at the mayor. They're trying to blame New York. They're trying to blame New Jersey <laughs> for the bridges. The bridge was messed up, and that, that caused the backup. And then New Jersey is saying, okay, you guys didn't have the plows out. You weren't, <laughs> you weren't salting the grounds. You weren't, you weren't ready for the storm coming. I heard so many horrible things about how people had to almost stay overnight because they ran out of gas. I've heard stories of people staying in the car for maybe 12 hours, children being stranded in buses. <laughs> and driving personally, this is one of the worst storms I've ever driven in. Because they weren't prepared. They weren't prepared. They, they, they didn't call in the extra workers. They didn't salt the areas. They didn't salt the roads. And this message right now is to prepare you. To prepare you. To prepare you. Because I believe that times are coming now, especially in America, where there will be severe persecution for believers in Jesus Christ. There's times coming right now 
where your faith is going to be tested, it's going to be challenged, it's going to be ridiculed, it's going to be made fun of. Someone told me, they know something, Jesus Christ is just like the old Odyssey, the old, the old Greek, Greek mythology, that he wasn't a person that was real. And I told him, he lives in me. <laughs> he is real. Because he lives inside of me, he is real. That he is real and his word is true. And if you don't have this solid foundation, biblical truth that pastors begin to begin to lay down, that you don't have this solid foundation, you cannot stand. Because if it just takes a little bit of the word of God, you twist it. You twist it a little bit, you change the whole meaning. Christ, the solid rock upon which we stand. I just want to give honor to, to Mama V, to Brenda, to all the people who stayed there to 10, 11 o'clock at night that went to feed the homeless. That Such a devotion of Mama V's heart. I just love her. <laughs> I just praise God for her. I just pray God for her, de for her devotion and her just being able to have a heart for people that I I've never seen someone who's tireless in her love for people who are less fortunate, that she, she, she never gives up, never gives up. She, she never gives up, never backs down. She just keeps on moving. And I just pray as she keeps on moving, God, keep help me to keep on moving with her, <laughs> to give him honor and to give him glory. Amen. 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 Right now, we're just going to pray. We're going to ask God's blessing over us and his protection over us and I just pray you take this word with you this week that you hold on to it that will encourage you to know that you're not fighting this battle alone that you're standing upon someone who can't be shaken and someone who doesn't make mistakes and someone who loves us in spite of our mistakes in spite of our weaknesses and his failure our failures his love never changes his love never gives up on us and his mercy is new every day, morning by morning, you get a second chance. Amen.